Okay. All right. All right. Jessica. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Welcome, everybody, for this ongoing series of Empathy Circle, hosted by the Empathy Tent for Bridging Political Divide, created by Edwin Rush, who's here. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm going to be the MC and one of the facilitators today. Um, and why we're doing this Empathy Circle is because our intention is to contribute to bridging the social and political divides and to build a culture of empathy around the world. And so for people watching, uh, you are also, of course, invited to take part in future di dialogues. And to know more about it, you can visit empathytent.com or empathycircle.com uh, if you want to look for more information. Um, before we're going to go through uh, quickly the instructions again of the empathy circle, I'd like to go um, I was going to say around, but since we are in a virtual circle, uh, <laughs> let's go uh, around and um, if you can give your name, where you're from, and you put political leaning, I can model that. My name is Jessica. I'm from France, as you might have here my accent, and um, I live in Toronto right now, though, and my political leanings are uh, mostly left and green. Um, and. Um, Dave, if you want to, to continue. Uh, I'm Dave Gottfried. I live in Berkeley. I am one of the people that goes with Edwin to, to the protests. And uh, I'm, on, I'm on the left also. I would say these days I'm center, I, I'm center left. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, Bill? There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name You're is. You're muted, Bill. Uh, it shouldn't be now. You're good, You're good now. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Bill. Uh, uh, I'm on the left, but it's complicated. <laughs> Oh, oh you're muted. Sorry, where are you situated again, Bill? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm situated in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nilang, I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, Nilang. So my name is Nilang, and uh, I'm from India. And right now I live in Berkeley. And I definitely don't define myself either being on the right or left. I think I'm actually for what's good for people, what's good for country and what's good for the planet as a whole. Wonderful, thank you, Ian. Evan? Hi, my name is Evan Magor, I'm from New York, and um, right now I'm bouncing between cities, different cities every couple months. I'm in Seattle currently. Um, I've identified as a liberal for most of my life, but um, you know, I definitely see empathy as a path for, for us all. Yeah, thank you. Art? If you want to go next. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name's Art. I am uh, currently living in Denver, Colorado. And uh, yeah, it's complicated for me, too. I, I, I definitely feel liberal and I definitely feel progressive, but, uh, <laughs> but I, like to, um, I like to do what's good for the planet as well. That was really well said, my, my friend there. Um, so yeah, that's me. I think mostly center, but progressive, I guess. Uh, did you say where you were? Second? I'm in De yeah, Denver, Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Thank you. Thank no you, Art. Thank you. Louis? Hi, I'm Louis Griggs. I'm also in Berkeley, California. I'm, <clears throat> I call myself center, but the truth is I'm as far left as you can get on human rights issues because I helped start the whole diversity training movement 40 years ago in the U.S. as a straight white guy who needed to do it for myself. And... I'm as far right as you can get on some financial issues and global issues as a Stanford MBA and a straight white male. Um, so I'm, I'm a never Trump liberal Republican and there are only about three of us left in the country. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Louis. Um, Todd? Hi, I'm in Texas. And that means that I seem super liberal in the culture that I live in. Um, but like everybody else, I just want 
a thriving uh, world and for people to be able to thrive in it. So I'm for whatever produces that. All right, thank you, John. JJ? I'm from a small mountain town in Pennsylvania. I'm about as far right, I would think. Well, I'm far right on most issues. I'm also a constitutionalist. Um, I'm also a three percenter, um, which is militia. I believe in free markets, personal liberty and responsibility, small government. And um, I believe the individual outweighs the group as a whole. I, I believe people sh shouldn't be put in boxes and uh, that we need to look at individuals instead of large groups when we find solutions to these problems. So okay. pretty far right. All right, thank you, JJ. Um, Megan, I know we can hear you, but if you can type on the chat uh, where, where you're from and uh, your leanings. And in the meantime, Edwin, if you want to, to introduce yourself. Yeah, Edwin Rutsch, uh, live in El Cerrito, California, which is near Berkeley, San Francisco Bay Area. Grew up on the right uh, through years of travel, etc. Moved to the progressive side. And uh, since starting to learn about empathy, I've moved to the empathy side. So <laughs> coming from a culture of empathy, which tries to listen to all sides. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Edwin. Um, I'll share what Megan wants. Megan will um, share what she has on the chat. In the meantime, so um, how to do an empathy circle and what it is? Oh, here we go. Megan from... California, Chico. Awesome. Chico, that's a funny name. I like it. <laughs> Chico, California. Did everyone introduce themselves? Art, did you? I... Yes. Oh, you yeah. Okay, sorry. If I'm correct. And she considers herself an anarchist and value empathy. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> So what is an empathy circle? Um, I wanted to do a quick, um, going through again some instructions and some logistics for today and, and clarifying to be all on the same page of what we call an empathy circle. Um, we call it like an empathy circle is a small group of individuals like us today who speak, listen and reflect back to each other using a structured format to build mutual understanding. So that's the definition I wanted to offer for today. Uh, today we have a topic that is, what are feelings of concerns, anxiety, or fear you have about the current political situation, uh, most particularly in the US, I believe. Um, like Edwin mentioned, the videos are recorded and are gonna be posted on the Empathy Tent YouTube and Facebook. It's gonna take about two hours. We are gonna stop 15 minutes before uh, today and uh, to give a chance for everybody to share uh, the, the one thing that they find the most helpful about participating in an empathy circle. And because today um, we have a lot of participants, we're gonna break out in groups. So uh, Edwin is gonna, uh, we're gonna be divided in like two different groups so that it's easier to do empathy circles that way. Um, what does someone say? Okay, the instruction. I believe who hasn't never done an apathy circle before? If you can raise your hands or show me, give me an idea. JJ, okay, anybody else? Okay, so I'm gonna go, today JJ, I'm gonna go through the quickly, um, the instruction. I send, Edwin and I send the instruction to everybody. Um, I'm gonna go through all the steps quickly. And JJ, would you like us to do a demo to show you before or? We can jump right okay. no i've watched a few so i've, I've watched a couple also awesome. yeah. well what i what i'm going to do is i'm just going to talk about the instruction quickly um just talking through and then we'll do the empathy circle right away okay. um awesome so the step number one in an empathy circle is one person selects who they want to speak to so it's your responsibility to select i want to speak to that person and then you speak about today the topic that I mentioned before. 
and you are going to have a time. You're going to speak between three to five minutes. And if it's more than five minutes, we are going to ask you to uh, wrap it up. Uh, number three, the step number three is the listener reflects back what they are hearing until the speaker feels heard and understood to their satisfaction. Step number four, it's the listener turns, uh, then it's the listener's turn to select who they want to speak to once the first speaker is done. And for that, the new listener to reflect back what they are hearing. So it's like by turn. Everyone helps hold the circle process by monitoring and sticking to the steps to the best of their abilities. And some of those, the facilitators today, um, Edwin, me, and uh, Dave, I believe. Um, is Lewis as well? Are you a facilitator as well today, Lewis? Or are you a participant? No, oh, I said that when I'm willing to be if one is needed, but if there are only two groups, it seems that none is needed. You, we have the two of you, correct? Okay. Correct. That's correct. I guess it's going to be just uh, uh, me and Edwin then. Awesome. Um, we are, um, you, we might interrupt you sometimes to guide you a little bit if we find that uh, it needs some guidance. So um, don't take it personally if we interject and like help you to, to with the process. Any questions so far? Everybody's good? No, I would like to know how we can please download the program into our brains <clears throat> so that we can all speak French with you. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> We were talking that we might do French and Petit Circle. That could be an opportunity to practice your French. <laughs> Actually, right. before we start, I have one suggestion because with yes. um, for Megan, there still might be a way to hear you. I, I realized when you were you had you have your phone in front of you, so that's probably why we couldn't hear you because Zoom probably doesn't have like a, a way to make it speaker phone. So you could potentially bring the phone to your mouth when you speak and then just go like that. So just wanted to throw that out there before we spend the next hour, you know, without having tried at least one more thing. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Evan, for that tip. Talking about tip, I wanted to share a few speaker and listener tip. Uh, for the speaker, keep in mind to pause to let time for the listener, uh, to let the listener a chance to reflect back. There's so much where we can take in, so be mindful to um, stop and let time for the listener to reflect back what they hear. Once you feel fully heard, please mention by uh, maybe saying, I'm fully heard, I'm okay, I'm good, so that it's an indication and a clue for, um, to take different turns. For the listener tip, uh, try to reflect as much as possible in your own words. It's not exactly paraphrasing, so reflect but what you think you hear. We really strongly ask you to, reframe, to refrain from asking questions, judging, analyzing, advising, which I know is very hard for a lot of people, sympathizing, keep your opinion until it's actually your turn to speak, and it's a very uh, important thing in the empathy circle process. When, when you are the listener, it's not your turn to share your opinion. It's your turn, your responsibility is to reflect back and to listen what you hear. And when it's your turn to speak, share whatever you need to share. The last thing I want to mention is that what's great about an empathy circle is like, it doesn't matter if you want to respond to someone's mentioning something, you don't have to select that person to respond them directly to. It's for a few reasons. It's because we want to, for everybody to have a chance to go through it. If you just keep having a back and forth with just two people, it's not gonna be that interesting and not everybody's gonna be able to practice. So try as much as possible. If really something resonated with you and you want to respond to that, it doesn't have to be that person. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see nodding, perfect. All right, I'm done with the instructions. If there's no questions, we're going to go into breakout groups. Okay, so I created the breakout groups, and David and Lewis will be in, in the second group, and David uh, will, uh, Dave will facilitate. So I'll be silent, and, and Dave will be silent, too, and kind of give space for the others. So does that sound good? Are you ready? To... You're muted, Dave. How many are we in each group? Uh, there's going to be five in one group and then six in one. Okay, great. Okay. 
So how do we go into these groups? I do it. It'll, you'll go in, and then when when the I'll call you back. Uh, you'll just be pulled back 15 minutes. It'll we'll give you like a one minute warning to kind of wrap up. It'll come back. Sorry, Edwin. Yeah, thank you. You should be able to see a box in front of your screen that says breakout room, join or something, like that, and you click on that, and then you'll be automatically be put in a room. Okay, and then for recording. Oh, yeah, Dave, if you uh, do the recording, there's a little button. You have permissions to record. There's a little button on the bottom right. Yeah, okay. To start recording, and then you can stop recording when you come back into the room. Yeah. Okay. So working. Okay, so here we and go. I don't, one more question. Okay. The, we're stopping. You're going to bring us back in 15 minutes ahead, and we're going to all be together? How is that going to Yeah, we're gonna, we'll end all together, and we'll just do a, sort of a debrief of kind of your experience. Uh, Jessica has a question that will go around. Yeah, and Art, I think your hand was up. Yes, I don't see a box for breakout groups. I'll, I'll create, create that, right? Oh, okay, okay. Cool. Now. Thank you. Oh, there we go. You're invited to join a breakout, and you just click that box. Whoops. Where, what happened? There we go. So I, I'm kind of learning this process, so. Awesome. Um, I'll just be the, do you, do you want to, who should be, one of us could just be the silent, oh, we can all take part, I guess. But however, yeah, I, th I think Edwin and I are also like happy to be participants, um, and we also facilitate if needs be, so um, oh. who would like to start? And we're doing timing of three minutes, I forgot to mention that. Yes, we are, yeah, yeah, I did mention that. Do you have a... Uh, yeah, so you can, if does someone want to speak to me, for example, just to sort of model it and... Yeah. Nilang, if you want to start, I see that you are like smiling. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you're, oh, you're muted. Let me unmute you. It, there was a little bit of background noise before, so I muted you. Okay, I think you should be okay now. Um, no, I was just saying that, uh, what should I actually start sharing first? Uh, can you actually tell me a little bit about it? Okay, so our topic was, uh, what is the feeling of concern, anxiety, or fear you have about the current political situation? Uh, sure, so, um, actually talk to, um, Edwin. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, um. My only concern uh, right now uh, in the kind of situation we are living in is that people um, tend to create boxes and then um, start having this mentality of us versus them. So what I mean by that is I can create a box based on my political divide, based on where I come from, based on race, religion. So I create those boxes. And then whoever doesn't quite fit in that boxes, I actually consider them others. And then I tend to have not empathy for those people. And that is the fundamental issue that I think we are facing as a humankind. And the only solution to overcome this fundamental issue is i believe the empathy empathy i believe is the bridge that can not only join or connect the hearts of different people who actually are divided based on political uh beliefs okay let me just reflect back that was quite a bit so what i'm hearing <laughs> is you're saying that the main problem in society is this uh these people creating these groups kind of in group out group us versus them groups and you see that as the main so your real concern is about how people are creating those groups and that you're you're saying that i believe you're saying that that it's empathy that bridges those groups that in and out group and that's what you value is that bridging and, and bringing those groups together absolutely i feel hurt yes 
Is there more? You have a minute. Um, no, with that, I would just like to conclude that um, if we tend to see more of humanity being the foundation in every heart, in every person, we'll be able to overcome all the different divides and can truly work for the betterment of a humanity and the entire planet. Mm -hmm. right? So you're really saying that the way to kind of move forward is to see everyone's humanity and seeing the humanity of everyone is sort of the way forward. Uh, and that's kind of what helps bridge the divide. That's very true. Yep, I feel hurt. Okay. Then I'll speak to uh, JJ. Um, yeah, I, I'm really grateful that you're here because we have a little bit of struggle, struggle getting people on the right to take part. And so I'm really glad that you're here. Very grateful. <laughs> so if you just want to reflect that back. JJ, you can just reflect I, that back. Yeah. I heard you say how grateful you are that I was here. Um, I heard you say that it's difficult to get people on the right in, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh -huh. really yeah, and exactly. And and then the, the other part is, is we do have reached out to the right quite a bit at these different rallies. So I've had people like uh, Joey Gibson in Empathy Circles and have reached out to Amber Cummings, who organizes the right-wing rallies in, in Berkeley. So we really do try to reach out uh, and listen to the, to the right. We haven't been so successful in getting them into empathy circles online. So for that, you're, it's, it's really great to have you take part. Again, I'm sharing my gratitude. Oh, I heard you talk about your gratitude again. <laughs> I discussed the difficulties, and I understand that, and I hope that I can help bridge some of that divide. But yeah, and if you just reflect back the part about Joey and Amber, then... Oh, that's true. I, I heard you discuss Joey and Amber uh, bringing people from the right in um, and trying to bridge that gap. Yeah, yeah, I feel heard. Thank you. I feel fully heard. So. so I did watch that video too, though. <laughs> <laughs> so it's your turn to select whoever you would like and now and speak you have you'll have three minutes to start so i have to i pick somebody to to talk okay yeah. uh, i'm not quite sure who to pick um i should have wrote everyone's names down i'm not I, sure who's you can see the names by oh there's uh there's jessica and art and neelan um who is the, do we have the person that doesn't have volume uh she's not in this group okay that's gonna uh, I, I'd like to hear from Jessica. Sure. You're not going to hear from me. I'm the one gonna go, is going to listen to you. So by choosing who you're going to talk to, you are going to speak for two, uh, uh, three to five minutes, and I'm just going to reflect by what I'm hearing from you. Okay. So I, my turn to speak. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I wasn't sure if you were going to participate or not. I just, it was neat. To, I wanted to hear something different. Okay. So... When it comes to these small um, identity politics issues that seem to be dividing the country and uh, making it a very polar battleground these days, um, I feel that the small grouping of people from the identity politics is actually causing more harm than good. Um, I understand that there are people that feel oppressed in our cultures and um, I understand how people want to help them by giving them re extra resources, more attention, um, more empathy. But I feel that by doing that, it's actually pitting the majority of society against a very small group of people. Um, it does seem to be, can I start to reflect back already? Sure. So that I can um, make sure I'm I, um, not forgetting something. Um, so what I'm hearing, like you, you want to show your understanding about um, there are difficulties here and um, there you also identifying that there is a smaller group for, you think there's a smaller group in the US that is um, maybe asking for a lot and you are, as much as you understand, what they're asking, you feel like it might, it's, 
it's in the um, in detriment of the bigger majority. Um, am I hearing that right? I, I I should I guess I could be a little clearer. Um, okay, so the way it seems right now in our society is there are everybody's put into a minority group, whether it be by race, certain religions, certain genders. But there seems to be one group that's left out of that completely, and that's the white guy or the conservative person. Like there's a section that seems to be the bad guy in our culture. Um, I don't look at people as large groups like that because I understand that those large groups break down to the individual. And the individual has different needs than the large group. Um, my fear is that by doing this, it is going to force, say, white men to consolidate in defense. And that's actually going to have the opposite um, consequence of what most people are looking for. Mm. I, I, okay the pitting against each other just seems to be making things worse so say that, say that again the last part sorry the pitting, oh, the pitting groups of people against each other seems to be working negatively as opposed to bringing society together okay the, so what i'm what i'm um hearing jj um, is that you are seeing that a lot of uh, what's happening here for you right now is like there's a lot of we're talking a lot about minorities and then you're wondering like yeah but what about like the white guy we don't talk about that person and and you fear you talked about like you are you wondering that by doing that it's going to be not um helpful to be able to move society forward and then you are you are you fear of the consequences that it might be for uh that uh, the white grab group to, to be maybe excluded from the discussion of all the minorities that are being created and then you're wondering like uh what the consequences might that be that's what i'm hearing so what's um am i hearing that right yes yeah i, I feel like you heard me yes yeah is there anything else Right yes. Um, I just want to make it clear that I'm not saying, oh, poor white guys. That's mm -hmm. not what I'm saying. Um, but to look at things in such large, large groups, it isn't doing justice to the people that say, okay, women are a minority. So right there is 50% of the population. And then all the racial groups are minorities. So then it just leaves kind of white guys out in the end and are in our political environment and through the media, these are the bad guys now, mm -hmm. are the white men, the controllers of everything and all that. But what that does is completely forget about all the white men that are struggling with suicide, drug addiction, depression, you know, all the, the vast majority of white men aren't rich, powerful people. And they have the same problems as everybody else. So I, the identity politics is keeping us from looking at the underlying issues and looking at the outside mm. versus the struggles of mankind. Okay, so let me try to reflect back as much as I can. Um, you, you wanted to make sure that first of all, you were clear that you're not like, like Ubu, poor white guy. Um, you wanted to, 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 to mention that. And then, and then you were saying the thing is like, um, you mentioned the woman are minority for you. The, there's a lot of different like diversities, uh, different minorities in ethnicity. Uh, and we talk about the issues they're having. And then you're wondering yet, yeah, okay. And then the thing is like all those people are rallying against the white dude. And then you think, but the white dude that they're rallying against is like the white rich dude that does not represent maybe me even. Like it's like, we are not all like in our ivory tower and we are like, I, it sounds to me that you were saying there's a lot of white um, men that are going through the same struggles that what the minority are struggling. And when we are not able to talk about it because we are being demonized maybe, 
that was the five minutes, and we'll come back around, so you'll get get another chance to kind of go deeper to. So. Yeah. Oh, so my mistake. You. No, no, that, that that's okay, and that's why we're timing because those discussions are. We want to talk a lot and uh, and more, and we also want to be everybody to have a chance to talk. And as, when you're going to be picked, you're going to be able to have the chance to speak as well. So uh, we. It's going to be a continuous conversation as, as we go around, okay? I feel like you heard me. Okay. <laughs> Thank Sorry you. it took me long to get to the point. I'm not very good at this. I'll, I'll work that's to keep it. Okay. We, we, we're here to practice. That's, there's no right, no wrong here, okay? <laughs> Thank you, JJ. So I guess it's my turn to choose who I want to speak to. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to speak with Art. So uh, what <clears throat> that's interesting because... Um, I'm living in Canada and I'm from France. So we have a very different, I feel, uh, views on like um, political scenes. Like even when I said, you know, I'm leaning more towards the left, the green, the, le the way the left is in France doesn't even appear that much in the US. Like it's, it's such a spectrum that if I say I'm, I'm left, uh, the left from France would be seen as the super far, far left in the US. And I just wanted to mention that first, that there is also a, this spectrum that uh, there is in the political um, international scene. Oh, and I can stop there and you can stop if you want. Terrific. Great, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm hearing you say that, that, the, uh, that there's a great difference um, between, uh, you know, France, especially, and maybe even Canada, um, in terms of the spec, the political spectrum that it, it translates to a different, um, a different place on the spectrum from the U.S. to France. Yes, yeah, and, I, and I, thank you. I wanted to clarify that first. Um, in terms of my feelings or concerns of anxiety, um, my biggest concern, as I am an environmental activist as well, is like climate change and I'm really, really sad and really, really scared of not seeing any leadership, strong leadership, and I'm talking actually internationally. Um, <clears throat> for me, that's, that should be number one in the political scene because climate change is a human right issue, it's an immigration issue. Um, all the little things that we've been kind of putting in the trash and not really wanting to take care about, like immigration, for example, it's just, emerging so strongly because there's going to be more and more immigration because of like um, uh, places in the world that's going to push people to leave their country because of the flood and stuff. So I'm, I'm so annoyed um, of not seeing that as number one everywhere. Like everybody should be working on that. That's my biggest concern. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, I hear you say that, uh, I believe you said you're an animal rights activist. Um, and, uh, and that environmental. You, I'm sorry? Environmental, not animal. Environmental, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I, um, I misheard that, but now I hear you say that you're an environmental activist and that you're, uh, your number one concern is environmental because um, this is something that we're all affected by. This is, you know, we only have one world is what I'm hearing you say. And yeah. that you're, you're having a hard time that there is no leadership that's putting that in the forefront. And you feel from what I'm understanding is that you feel that um, that a lot of the other issues like immigration, for instance, is in the forefront, but that's really more of a result of the environmental issues that are not being addressed. Uh, not exactly. That. I, I guess all the situations, the issues we have right now are going to be aggravated so much more by climate change. So we, by not addressing climate change, we're just putting in a back burner like stuff that we should deal with that with it right away like by dealing with climate change things are going to be better for the rest of it because we're going to have to deal with those things i guess what i'm saying and um oh i lost my train of thought there was something else but i, I'm, I can stop here okay thank you for clarifying i, I think i i'm maybe misspoke but uh i, I understand okay. that you're saying that the um you know things that are being put on the back burner are going to become more urgent as a result of not dealing with climate change yes i guess um 
it's not really well said the way I said it, but this is something like that. Yeah, I, f I feel heard on that. On that, yeah. Thanks, okay. Art. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, is it Nilong? Am, am I pronouncing that correctly? You're muted, Nilong. Oh, <laughs> I just unmuted. There's a bit of background noise, so I muted you. So unmuted. Yeah. Perfect. Did I say that name yeah. right, Neil Long? Okay. Well, yeah, you did. Uh -huh. Okay, I'd appreciate if you could reflect back to me. Would you like that? Absolutely, yes. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, uh, I would like to jump off of what uh, Jessica was saying, because actually the, the thing that causes me the most um, urgent anxiety that I feel um, of the current political situation is very similar in, in terms of, you know, the environmental uh, aspect. And, and actually, I am an animal rights activist, which, um, which <laughs> I thought I was identifying with Jessica, but um, I feel that the animal rights activism is, is very much in, you know, very entwined with the environmental issues that we're seeing. And, uh, and it concerns me that, um, that the leadership, especially here in the US, is not paying attention to either environmental issues nor you know um, animal agriculture issues and that um and that there's a really fast pace that we're moving in undoing what environmental protections have been put in place and it's it's very scary to me so i'll pause there so what you actually heard is your continuation of the thought from the conversation with jessica and you completely align your values um, uh, in that manner uh, that you're also concerned about uh, climate change. But what you think is and what you believe is the animal rights also has a huge impact on our, on our environment. And in um, our political system, especially in the US, we don't quite understand and consider the negative impact of the animal agriculture on the environment that right yes yes um you know the the only thing that i would clarify is that is that what really causes me concern is the is the pace at which these things are going um you know i feel that that the um you know the the corporate polluters as well as the the growth of animal agriculture is is not slowing down it seems to be picking up and uh mm. and that's very frightening to me because with every new report that comes out on climate change it's like every time they tell us we have even less time than they thought we had before and you know i just i dread waking up one morning and you know just finding out that we're past some point of no return that's a a very deep fear that's present for me right now Right. So what I heard you say is you're really concerned about the pace. We are actually recovering. We are actually progressing because the damage to the environment from animal agriculture as well as from the industry, it's so much deteriorating and it's so much fast paced that we're not keeping up with it. And more and more we actually hear and more reports come in we realize that now we have a very short period of time to actually get recovered from it. Yes, exactly. Thank you, I feel heard. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Nilang, you can choose who you want to speak to now. <clears throat> um, um, I'll choose uh, Jessica. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, um, I, I feel, um, I, I feel that my heart kind of opened up with the conversation that I have been hearing, um, especially, um, the, the perspective that, um, JJ actually brought in, um, even though I believe in uh, empathy for all, um, it was, it was amazing and surprising to me that I definitely didn't think about that particular part or, or that particular group of people to also include in, you know? So I'm having a really good moment where I feel like my heart is opening up. Also, I am an animal rights activist, so I completely align and agree with what Art said. So I'm feeling really happy and I feel like in the circle, 
where we all share very, very similar values. So I'm really glad to be part of right now in this empathy circle. Wow, yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of gratefulness from you and you were saying a few times that your heart opened uh, first by hearing JJ perspective and you were like, oh wow, I never really thought from that place. And, um, and then it's, it really meets also your idea of empathy for all. And now you're like, wow, like now maybe I, I can understand better. And then you were also saying, um, also what we feel super grateful is like, yes, animal activists, you completely align with what Art, what Art was saying. And you realize, well, even if we hear thinking we are all different, we actually have the same values and that makes you feel so ah, happy. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. I completely feel heard. Thank you, Jess. Right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Nuleng. <laughs> um, I can talk to JJ if you want to do some reflection. JJ? Sure. I'm going to talk to you. Okay. Um, what can I say? That's interesting. I wanted to say that um, I was a bit triggered uh, listening to you when you said the women are a minority because, and then after you said it's 50%, and I was like, if we are 50%, we are not really a minority. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I was like, oh, wow. I'm, I noticed myself being triggered by that. Um, and and, I, and I, that's interesting what Nilang was saying as well of like, that perspective you gave as well of like, you know, yes, like we talked about a lot of like the diversity and the, all the um, different minority groups. And like Nilang and I had never really seen that the white man can feel not heard because they are struggling in their own way and they're not really aligning themselves with what's happening to uh, people like the, the rich white guy um, that you might not really identify with and then you also want to be heard for like your experiences and I thought that was also a good um, like oh wow yeah I was grateful to hear that if you want to reflect that back I heard you say that you were a little triggered at first about the woman comment. Um, I heard that it um, kind of opened your eyes a little bit to hearing that some white men don't, uh, I can't think of the word, connect with the richer white men. Um, and I heard that it was kind of new to you, you know, that, that you haven't really thought about that. Mm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say new to me, but I would say like, oh, I, I appreciated hearing it f like that way. Um, I, I, I appreciate f coming from that perspective. Uh, yeah. Okay. I heard you say that you appreciate that perspective. Yes. Okay. That is going to make me, um, like, like, again, like Nilan said, like, I do also believe, like, empathy is, like, universal. It's, it's not, like, by, like, um, yeah, for, it's, it is for everybody, literally, for me. And so, and I do struggle sometimes as well, like, of empath empathizing with certain groups. I struggle with empath empathizing with Trump, for example. I, like, I really would like to understand where he coming, he's coming from, and it's very difficult for me. And so that perspective of you saying, you know, we're not all identifying like, like him, even though you are a white dude. I was like, oh, wow. That was a reminder for me to be careful to not put everybody in like a category, <laughs> right? I heard you say that um, not to put everybody in the same category. Uh, I heard you say that, uh, not all white dudes can relate to Trump. Um, and uh, I, I don't know really how to put it. I, I'm, yeah. I'm lacking the words here, I'm lacking the words. <laughs> it, maybe we just uh, use my own words if you're not able to find your own words. Like if you can even paraphrase okay. to show me that you kind of like heard. Okay, uh, I heard you say that um, I'm lost. I lost it. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I'm sorry. The, the, the main <laughs> thing for me was it was a good reminder for me to hear that. Okay. I heard you say it was a good reminder for you to hear. Perfect. Yeah. And the last thing I would add is also I want to be careful 
to avoid the mistake of putting everybody in, in, in like a basket. Like if I don't like Trump, it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna like every other white dudes. And I didn't realize that maybe I was doing that to some extent. I heard you say that you have to be careful not to put every, you know, all white dudes in the same basket. Um, and that, uh, well, I guess that's really it. That's, that's Yeah, that that's was that, yeah. It. Thank you, thank you, JJ, I feel heard. Okay. So um, now it's your turn to choose someone to speak to. Hmm. I think I'm gonna go with art. I'd like to talk to art. Um, cool. <clears throat> the environmental issues, uh, to me, coming from a small rural town in Pennsylvania, um, surrounded with farming. Um, there's no cities nearby. So for us, the environmental issues are, are much different, I think, than what people see in the city. Uh, I, I think that people, I think the big problem with the environmental issue is a lot of people don't see the negative effects of what's going on. I think that's the main thing because to me, people only relate to what they can see themselves. So for much of the country, it's beautiful green trees, farmland, you know, it, they're not seeing the droughts, the, you know, so it's, it's just a different perspective, you know? Cool. Um, and also coming from the right, we have very different news about the environment than the left does. We were told that the glaciers are rebuilding, you know, that there's more ice sheets now than there ever was. We're told, you know, we get different news, you know, we're, we're told that global warming is, isn't real. And there are just insane amounts of facts to back that up, even though there's a insane amount of facts to say it's true. You know, and most people, I think, just don't really want to look at it because it doesn't affect them. And I, I think that's possibly the biggest problem with environmental issues is just the lack of proof in people's lives. Mm. And I think that's really affecting the whole world. And I think that might be why we're just not really preparing for it. Cool. You know, if you don't mind, I'd like to reflect back. That's that's a lot. I don't want to lose track. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I got no, no. it down. Yeah, yeah, it's something to get used to. It's it's no big deal though. It's you know, it's it's the first one. Don't be don't worry about that. But um uh what I heard you say is that um for uh for personally because you're you're in a small town rural uh Pennsylvania with lots of farms and lots of green that you you know, you think people in your area don't well, I think overall you're saying that that because people don't necessarily see the uh the effects of climate change that it's hard for people to feel the urgency of it um and then on top of that you're saying that especially because being on the right uh the sources of you know facts are um are diametrically opposed from those that the left are seeing and that also makes it very hard to to believe in the climate change uh issues i get that right absolutely i feel like you cool. definitely heard me thank you cool is there more time? Does JJ two minutes, more time? two more minutes. Oh, okay. Um, so the, uh, the environmental issue, um, one of the big things in the rural communities that we hear about is the negative af aspect of livestock. Um, the carbon footprint of farms, the pollution of fertilizer, uh, things that, you know, the negative aspects of farming and raising animals. Uh, a big part of the problem that we also have is lack of alternatives to doing those things. <clears throat> in, in, in this world, people have to eat. You know, these farms have to provide a certain amount of food for the public. And there's just not really solid alternatives for them. All right, yeah, I, I hear you saying that, um, that uh, again, particularly in the area where you live, which is farmland, uh, both you know agriculture and animal agriculture, um, that um, that you hear a lot of 
talk about climate change and in specifically is as far as the negative impacts of those practices but at the same time you you feel that there is no alternative and that we all have to eat and that you know th that this practice even with its damage it it serves a necessary role in our lives because we need to eat is that essentially what you're saying yes i feel like you heard me yes. cool man do you feel like adding one more thing i think okay, you sure have. um yeah. I guess I'll step back to the, the kind of identity politics things we were talking about earlier. Um, one of the things that, that concerns me in the current political climate is that we're stepping away from looking at individuals' needs as opposed to trying to solve issues with large groups of people. Um, when it comes to poverty or oppression or whatever, I, I believe that the only way to solve that is by addressing each individual's situation that they struggle with. All right, I hear you saying that um, that uh, your your concern with the the uh, you know the the division of of our populace, I guess, into large blocks of people is. Um, is we're in that process we're losing out on the on the idea of the individual and that and that perhaps what is not you know what is best for the group is not necessarily best for the individual and and you believe that the way out of these issues like poverty and other things is is really to focus on the individual i, I feel hard awesome man thank you for sharing thank you. okay uh so Edwin, are you in on this? Yeah, I'm in on it. You can okay. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm sitting here all by myself. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I only have four uh, squares on my screen, and you're not in it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. Um, so will you reflect back for me? Yes, for pleasure. Cool, cool. cool. Um, yeah, um, a point that JJ made really um, is, is a trigger for me as well. Um, not an emotional trigger, but a trigger of thought. that um, <clears throat> This idea that, that we have different facts on both sides and and the 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 lack of trust that that just breeds and 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 again i think that that's getting you know worse not better and um that's something else that causes me anxiety because if we can't at least you know agree on what the actual problems are then i i fail to see how we're going to come together on a solution Okay, so something that triggered you, kind of upset you, uh, or angered or upset you about what JJ was saying, was that there's these different facts that the, the sides have. And if we can't have the same facts, then how are we going to be able to solve these uh, problems? So that's a real concern. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I would like to clarify is it wasn't an emotional trigger. It was more just a, a, a thought trigger. Uh, that, uh -huh, you uh -huh. know, yeah, no, I just want uh, so to... It was like, actually more of a thought trigger than a, a real feeling emotional trigger. Do I make that right. distinction? Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, because and specifically the reason I point that out is because it's not, you know, I'm not angry at people for believing alternative facts. I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned and I, I want to understand how, you know, sort of how this you know, it, it's sort of easy to see how we got here, but it's really hard to see how it's, it's possible to keep going in this way. Okay, so it's not like you're angry at people about these alternative facts, different facts. You're just noticing that and wondering how do we kind of move past that. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess the overriding fear that where anger might creep in on me is that, um, is that the motivation for it is is really uh, skewed, you know, because um, you know JJ talked about um, also like you know the individual versus the larger group, and I feel like a lot of this divide is as a result of of the very few powerful, you know, really sort of engineering this because it seems like no matter what the facts and no matter what the arguments, it seems like the people who come out ahead are the people on top of the pyramid. And, uh, and that's also something that I guess that's where I start getting a little bit more emotionally triggered. <laughs> uh, okay. So there is actually a point where you get emotionally triggered and upset. And that's about the sort of the people at the top who may be manipulating the system or manipulating some of this. And that is raising some real anger. 
Yeah, yeah, and it feels like um, you know, as as much as as we can empathize with each other, you know, as as individuals who are just part of this whole thing, um, you know, it's it's again, it's being engineered by some sort of you know far off power that's that doesn't care if we're empathizing with each other or not, and that's I think one of the most troubling things for me. Okay, so there's a troubling aspect that here we can sort of listen to and empathize with each other, but there are others who are not really empathizing, uh, sort of more an, an elite or the people in power, and, and that's very troubling, or that's troubling to you. Yeah, 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 because they're the ones who, who are gaining from this, you know, discord is my problem. So there's a concern that these people are, are actually gaining from if we're, if there's discord among the people that they actually gain from it and that's troubling. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Edwin. I feel hurt. Thank you. You got a minute much. and a half. Oh, uh, do I? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Go so slow. <laughs> what is your turn? <laughs> okay. Um. Uh. So. Um. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, I guess I'm I'm troubled and it causes me anxiety to 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 see, you know, to to see that if if we're not, you know, and I guess I'm saying the same thing that I said before, but but this this idea that we can't even agree on on a set of facts really, you know, I guess that that really does cause me a lot of anxiety and as I'm thinking about it now um because again that makes it seem just really um I don't know, very dire to me. Mm -hmm. So there's a real uh, concern, anxiety around if we can't agree on some co core facts that it just feels dire to you, uh, like how to move forward if we can't have that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I feel hurt. Okay. Then Nilan, i to speak to you and I'll unmute you because it'll... So, okay. And... Uh, so the first thing JJ had talked about was identity politics. And I think I, I have concern about identity politics as well. Um, I'll just start with that. Uh, are you, so I'm actually reflecting on you? Yeah, you're reflecting me. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, say it again then. I have concern about the identity politics as well. Oh, okay, so what I heard is that you also have a concern about the identity politics. Yeah, and I, I've been seeing this, like I, I, it, I went, I, I was advocating when the right wing came to Berkeley, I, I asked them if they would like to have a dialogue with the left. I reached out to the left and nobody would talk. And so that was kind of one thing. And then I went to a progressive church that was organizing a counter rally and they were doing this, they had a question and answer, and what they were saying is, is if you're a, a woman or a minority, you can speak first, you can have a line. So if you're a white male, you had to go to the end of the line. A, a woman or a white or a, a minority could step in front of you. And I'd never seen that before, because I don't kind of hang out in these groups. And I didn't realize how kind of extreme this, uh, this kind of identity politics stuff has become. Hmm. So what I heard is that you are truly concerned with the identity politics when there was pro and anti-Trump rally and you actually set up the tent and you asked this both the sides to come together and talk to one another, they weren't actually willing to. You also actually observed this progressive church where they were actually allowing women and minorities to actually speak first. And so if you are a white man, you definitely will get a last priority to actually speak your words. Yeah, they actually said that. It's like, okay, if you're a white male, you'll go to the end of the line. Anyone can cut in front of you. And I'm thinking, what? Has stuff gone this far within uh, left-wing identity politics? You know, that for me, it's like a matter of, it's like, you want to empathize with everyone, you know? It's like, uh, so I, I, I just, uh, yeah, that's pretty, that was pretty upsetting to me. I still have a bad taste in my mouth about that. Yeah, so what I heard is that you still have a bad taste in your mouth about the experience you had by just seeing them speak literally to prioritize the minority and the woman over the other. And if we are actually talking about the empathy, we have to actually empathize with all. Right. 
And that's what I would like to do is create an empathy movement, which I know you want to as well, where we're listening to everyone, like every voice matters. You know, you don't, you don't, you know, it's it, it shutting down voices or, you know, putting them at the end of the line is, is not, is not a constructive way forward. So I have real concerns about the direction that that, that is going. Yeah, so you have a real concern that where we are going isn't inclusive for all. And, um, and that's why you feel that um, we actually work on about the empathy part is important. Yeah, and then we had an empathy tent a meeting, and actually Joey Gibson was in the tent, and we had someone on the left, and we were doing a mediation, and we had by, by any means necessary, or uh, bam, and you know, the, the far right come, and they kind of screamed and yelled, and they kind of like tried to shut it down. So they were trying to shut down empathy. So there's a real, you know, the... The uh, far left is, is uh, you know, trying to shut down empathy. And I think there's going to, you know, and I want to be able to empathize with them too and try to dialogue with them. But it, it's, it's harder than I, I would have thought. Right. So your experience was that when you're trying to set up this empathy tent and bring people together, you definitely had a group of people who actually scream and try and shut down the empathy work that you are actually doing. And you have a real concern about that. Yeah, and that was the left. That was the far left that was doing that. So I think that needs to be kind of addressed. Um, I don't want to, like, demonize the, the far left. It's, not, it's just I don't want to demonize the rich, you know. Uh, so it's like because we want to see what can we do to bring everyone into a dialogue. And so that's kind of my intention. Yeah, so you don't definitely want to demonize uh, left side as well. You want to empathize with all, but you definitely have a real concern about it. And your um, um, real objective moving forward is actually to bring everyone together. From both That's sides. it. I feel fully heard. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Now, do I? Yeah. Um, let me see. Um, pick, choose choose yeah. first who you want to speak to. Um, I can actually speak to JJ. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I recently uh, started doing um, empathy work through my organization called Cultivate Empathy for All. And with this work, what I have come to realize is that the situation we are in is because we have two different group of people. We have two different group of politicians who are keep saying one or the other things. And we, as a residents, as a citizens, we don't fact check. We do not do our own research to see which side is actually lying or hold less of a truth. And that I believe is a foundation of the political divide that we are in, that we believe in politician and their shared knowledge and words than fact checking by our own. I heard you say that you, um... You have an organization focusing on empathy. Uh, I heard you say that the two political party wings is, is a concern to you because the messages are being believed from the politicians as opposed to people fact-checking them. And that this concerns you very much. Absolutely. Very well said. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that concerns me is people are less motivated to take an advantage of our democratic system. I believe democracy is a privilege, but we have to exercise that privilege in order to take a full advantage of it. As a democracy, as a, as a democracy um, 
every citizen, every resident has a power beyond to just vote during the election time. Every person has a power to go to the local council meeting, to speak to the local lawmakers and, and talk about if they are not quite in alignment with the individual values or with the values that community wants to see manifest in their local cities. I heard you say that participation in the voting process is a concern to you and that the citizens um, can exercise their political power by also going to local city council meetings and voicing their concerns about the politicians not following their, I forget the words you used, but uh, they're, not, they're not doing what they're saying they're going to do, you know, holding them accountable. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, that's exactly what I meant. And um, because we are not actually speaking to our lawmakers, we are rather stay home and watch a TV after the eight hours of work than going to this council meetings, going to this local commission's meetings. Um, that's why the lawmakers can actually get to do what they think is right. And majority of the time, it isn't in the benefit of the people, it's in the benefit of them, their political career, their position and upcoming election. And that's why I believe that the political, economic and environmental crisis that we are seeing right now, it's not because of one or the other bad guys out there, but it, we as a citizens have taken a very small responsibility in taking advantage of our democratic system. I heard you say that most citizens rather sit home and watch TV after eight hours of work than participate in the, the political system. Um, and that's why the politicians can do what they want because as people, we're not doing our part, a bigger part to hold them accountable and you know move this thing forward. Absolutely, that's correct. That's correct. And, 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 and just I want to end uh, the comment by saying that that is why we cannot say, oh, it's because the president in a White House is bad or is because this person is bad. It's all of our responsibility for the crisis that we are in today. I heard you say that it wasn't about the president being bad or a politician being bad, that it's our responsibility for the, the, the problems in society and in the political aspect today. Correct, correct, that we are in right now, the kind of crisis. Absolutely, I feel heard. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, I think, I'm going to uh, talk to Jessica, if I can. Sure. If you're done. Are you done? Are you? Okay. Okay. Um, the political differences in America and, and France are a lot. Uh, I, I noticed that France doesn't have the identity politics that we do. Um, but they are struggling with it right now. Um, I think a lot of our problems in America comes down to the pitting of people against other people, um, which makes certain groups dig their boots in and they're not open to hearing other messages because they feel defensive. Um, we have a lot of racial strife, we have gender strife, we have economic strife, like everybody else, but it's so polar right now that Americans aren't really looking at we the people. They're looking at groups. Um, and I know that I've seen France have similar issues. So my concern is that 
our country really just isn't looking at the country as a whole, as opposed to looking at smaller groups, and that's what's keeping us divided. Mm. Um, so let me see if I hear you cor heard you correctly. Like you, you were doing a bit of a parallel, saying like um, the identity. How do you call it? Po identity politics. Identity. Yes. Identity politics um, is pretty strong in the U.S. and you were comparing a bit like in France, it's not quite, but it's growing, um, apparently, that you were saying. Um, and then you were explaining um, in the U.S. that you are, your biggest concern is that you're not thinking that people are seeing the, um, the U.S. as a whole, but seeing like groups like that and that... Um, and that's your concern because you you want to be able to see it more as a um, as a whole, and then and then talk about individualistic needs, and not just focusing on groups here and there. Yes, I feel, I feel like you heard that definitely. Yeah, was there anything else on that? Um, finding solutions to to these problems in our society is going to take people to get outside of their comfort zone and what they, their core beliefs to look at the problems as a whole. Mm. So you were saying like, you really think that the way we're going to be able to find solutions for people to get outside of their comfort zones, um, to look at other people's values and not necessarily just focusing on their own values and then um, think more as like, um, um, I'm not sure if I if I remember like society as a whole like you really want people to be like hey like um, stop being defensive and then just see everything as a whole not just like your group. I I feel like you heard that. Um, the last thing I want to say is me personally, what I try and do is put myself in the shoes of the person or people that are going through a problem as opposed to a category of people. Um, it, for me, instead of looking at, say, uh, the poverty in certain minority groups, I try and think about how an individual there can rise up out of the state that they're in. Mm. So you're not seeing people as um, category or what, what they be, where do they belong to, what does they look like, but you want, you want to put yourself in someone else's um, what's going on for them and, and the problem they're having. So you, you're relating to the problem. You're not really, you don't want to relate to um, where, you, like the category of that. You just, you really want to put yourself in someone else's shoes that's going through something difficult and that you can relate, you want to relate to that. And that I'm guessing you, you even saying like, this is how we're going to find solutions by maybe even putting ourselves in people's shoes uh, uh, people going through difficult time, not anything else. For you, that's, it sounds like this is part of the solution. Yes, I, I, I feel like you definitely heard me. All right. And with that, I'm, I passed. Okay, okay, thank you, JJ. Thank uh, you. I can talk to Art. Uh, wow. I want to say first, I'm super enjoying the conversation um, because I know it's not easy to talk about those issues. So um, I'm feeling like it's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool to just be able to do that. Well, I hear you say that you're, uh, you're really enjoying this, uh, this particular session that, um, you know, it's really cool to be able to hear each other and, uh, and yeah, you think it's really cool. Yeah. And as another thing is um, listening to the, con the, the previous conversations, like one thing, like you were saying, like a thought trigger, like, like it reminded me of what I've um, done this course on privilege, uh, privilege, racism, sexism and stuff. And it really opened my eyes on a lot of things. And that reminded me of that as I was hearing uh, Nilong talking and then uh, Edwin, like I didn't know. And like, I think JJ pointed out like in France, identity politics like it took me a few turns to listen to you guys to be like what is that I, did, I didn't even know what it was um and listening to edwin's of like what he saw was like oh that's what it is and that's interesting because knowing that 
have more and more interesting in like privileges because I do believe we cannot talk about the issues right now without talking about privileges. And I'll stop here and then you can start to reflect. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so you, you referenced a course you worked with, uh, you took in, in privilege and, uh, and that that's really present uh, for you right now um, as you think about this, especially when you uh, try to wrap your head around this idea of identity politics, which is very foreign to you. Um, but you, you feel that you, we can't talk about these, these things in, in a solution-based conversation without addressing privilege. Yeah, and um, what I've learned is that how it's in, I, what I've been learning and like I'm, I'm going through also the learning and I want to read more books, but so far what I've been discovering is how it's important to keep in mind the history of what's been happening. <clears throat> like how um, France was a big colonial country and that's, that's important to, for me to keep that in mind because um, as a white woman walking on earth, like I can't even fathom how, how much privilege I've got, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like a privilege. Mm -hmm. I'm an immigrant in Canada. I had to work really hard to get there. And at the same time, I also need to be aware, I think, of my history of what people did, um, my ancestors did and uh, you know, slavery and stuff like that. I think it is part of my responsibility as now as a white person to maybe actually, to, circling back to identity politics, to shut up and listen what, what the people uh, we shut voices for the longest time because we thought that Catholicism or like white, like we, we, knew, we knew it all, we needed to like, um, save them because they look different than us. Um, I need to keep that in mind that for thousands of years, those, pe those people, like when I say those people, uh, people who colon that we went to um, colonized, um, got their voice sh shut down. And so now it's like, how can I find the balance between, well, I still want to have my voice heard as a white woman, but I also want to leave some space for other people, which would mean, and I'm wondering, does that mean I need to shut down? Not shut down, but to stay silent, to hear what the, what um, my neighbors has to say, you know what, like, sorry, it's been a lot. <laughs> That's good, I, I was with you the whole time, thank you. Um, uh, so you started out talking about the, the uh, knowledge and the research that you're, you're, you're trying to search for. Um, and then you, you talked about how, or what I heard was that um, the, the need to remember the history of, of how this, this came to be, it, the whole situation. And, and as, as someone from France, you, know, you, you talked about you know, the privilege as it relates to, um, to the, the French colonial, the history of French colonialism. And, and even though you don't feel as an individual that you're so privileged, you feel culturally, you know, by, by nature of your ancestry, that, that you have been privileged and that, you know, and that you, you feel this, this um, I, I sense an, an urge to, to somehow silence yourself to, to allow the people who have been ancestrally um, oppressed, even though you feel like you're, you're an immigrant in Canada, you, you're a white woman, you, you have issues that you would like to talk about too, and you're trying to find that balance. Perfect. Yeah, cool. that's, that's, I feel, I feel heard very much. Thank you, Art. Cool. Was there anything more? No. Okay. All There's right, always cool. more, but I'm going <laughs> to stop for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Um, JJ, <laughs> ready? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, you know, I, I, the, the identity politics thing is, is really obviously very strong in this, in this conversation as you know, it has a place to be strong. It's, it's, it's appropriate. Um, I, I'm thinking, you know, the, the whole, my understanding of empathy, um, is, is that it works best when we can see the other person as being just like us. 
right? So, so seeing, you know, the other side of an argument that, that that person who I'm arguing with is just trying to feel, you know, feel safe, feel heard, feel, you know, represented, you know, all the same things that I want. And, and, you know, speaking to identity politics, I think that's something that sometimes gets lost. I'll pause there. I heard you say that um, identity politics is an important part of the conversation. Um, I heard you say that empathy works best when we can relate to each other as people. Um, and that uh, the last part, <laughs> lost the last part. I have, first off, I have to apologize. I have MS and oh. my memory is just horrible. So I'm, oh, wow. Um, well, I'll, I'll um, make shorter, I'll, I'll speak, I'll make it's, more it's pauses. Okay. For it's okay, I, I just need to focus more. Um, so what you're saying was that, that um, we need to be able to relate to each other to be empathetic is, is the most part. Exactly, just, yeah, yeah, um, thank you. Um, and, and I think that, you know, uh, the, the one last thing that I said is I think that's what's really missing in, in the national dialogue of politics. And, um, and I guess it, it strikes me as, you know, more beneficial if we can see each other's similarities rather than each other's differences. I heard you say that empathy is missing in, the, the, in politics and that uh, it would do us a service if we looked at similarities as opposed to differences. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, and yeah, I, I heard, you know, especially with what you were saying earlier about, about farming, and this is something that I, I often come across when I talk to people about, you know, animal rights and, and agriculture and stuff is that, you know, it's really important for me to understand that, that people are doing what they think is right. And it's, it's not the individual that I should have a problem with. It's the construct that's creating the problem that I see. And I think if, if we can join together on a personal level, then dealing with that construct becomes more possible. I heard you say that when it, um, when it comes to farming, people are doing what they think is right and that that's not the problem you have, but it's the larger construct, the powers that be, you know, that's the main problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And again, I, I think, you know, bringing it back into, um, you know, identity politics is that, you know, and again, another point that you made earlier is that this, you know, the more we compartmentalize things, the less this, you know, this idea of similarity is, is present. And, and I think that's where sort of the, the end of the yarn is. And that's, you know, that's, that's where I think everything starts to unravel. I would just say when it comes to identity politics, uh, the compartmentalizing is, is uh, making things difficult and uh, that's kind of how things are gonna unravel. Right, you know? right. Specifically though, the reason why the compartmentalization makes it more difficult to, to feel empathy is because it focuses on what separates us. It focuses on what makes you different from me just by virtue of an ideal or by virtue of an identity. Um, and that's, that's antithetical to empathy because empathy is about say, feeling the other person being like you. I heard you say that the compartmentalizing is having us focus on the differences as opposed to what we have in common and that is crucial to empathy. Yeah, man. Yeah, thank you very much. I feel heard. Thank you, JJ. Sure thing. Um, Elon, I think I'm going to speak to him about, I guess we'll go with identity politics still. Um, let's see, for me in this political environment, and I think it's everywhere around the world, um, by focusing on the larger groups as opposed to the individual's problems, we're not finding solutions. We seem to throw resources at large groups of people, hoping that that will somehow solve their individual issues. When attention to the individual issues is obviously, to me, the solution. 
Yeah, so I heard you say um, that we are spending more resources for a guru rather than focusing on individual requirement. And um, uh, going forward, that's what we need to do. Rather than focusing more on the larger group, we have to understand the individual needs and requirement. I definitely feel like you heard that. Um, it's also important to me to understand that when dealing with large groups of people, I can't put them into a tiny little box that describes how all of them think. Uh, that there might be animosity from one group to another, but when talking to the individuals, the animosity might not be there. And that the individual has a different brain than what we like to think of the group as. Uh, I do not know the meaning of animosity, so can you actually like rephrase that part again, please? Okay, I'll, I'll make this simpler. Um, to me, it's important that we get individuals' opinions as opposed to looking at what, say, the mainstream tells us that a group of people believes. Gotcha. So um, instead of looking into uh, the individual, what we focus on, the group, the belief of the entire group. Yeah. I feel like you heard me there. Okay. Um, it's easy to categorize large groups of people because that's just easy to do. It's much harder to talk to individuals and realize everybody in that group believes different things. <laughs> and that those thoughts are what should identify the person, not the minority status. Gotcha. So you're saying that it's easier for us to... Um, recognize the belief of the entire group rather than looking into the individuals. Um, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, one more uh, for me. Let's, I'll just give an example, but this goes for any group. Let's say um, in America, there's a, a, a big feeling about black people feeling oppressed. I understand that. But when talking to individual black people, many of them will get angry if I say that they are oppressed because they feel that they're just as equal with the same responsibilities. as. Hmm. Hmm. So I heard you say that as a group, um, we come to know that the African-American, they are actually oppressed. But when you speak to the individuals, they actually get offensive by by knowing that they're actually oppressed, is that correct? Um, I guess I guess I can rephrase. Um, I I've had people get upset with me by saying that they're oppressed because they feel that they're not, and they have the same privileges and opportunities that I would have. Oh, okay. So people will actually get frustrated with you by knowing that. Um, that you think that they are actually oppressed, but actually they feel that they have the equal privileges that you actually have. Yes, I definitely feel hard. Um, and lastly, using the African American uh, characterization just now, it, it's not particular to that, it's all groups. Every group feels, you know, as a whole, feels like they have their issues. But yeah, when you talk to the individual, it kind of goes away. It becomes an individual battle as opposed to a group battle. Mm -hmm. So I heard you say that as a group, we actually recognize that there is an, a big issue. But when you actually talk to an individual, that issue actually disappears. Yes. Yes. I feel heard. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm done. Your turn. Uh, my turn. Um, I'll go with art. 
Um, Thank you. Um, I definitely feel very much aligned um, with your concern and uh, work that you actually do um, for animal rights. Um, but I also believe that um, it is um, a huge concern for us that uh, politicians don't really understand the negative impact of animal farming uh, on the environment, on the sustainability, on the antibiotic crisis, and more than anything, animal rights violation. And as a citizen, I feel that it's my responsibility to go out there, talk and contact to my lawmakers and say, this is what's going on. And I feel like that part is kind of missing in animal rights activism. Wow, I'll, uh, I'll reflect that back, thank you. Um, so I'm hearing that you're, you're very much aligned with the, the principles of, of uh, animal rights activism, which I, I said before, um, and, and that you, you do understand the, the need to, to talk to people and, and everything like that, but, but that what's missing is, is the local political um, thing, because you, you feel like politicians on a whole are, are not understanding the various impacts of environment, uh, you know, animal rights, you know, uh, antibiotic issues, you know, all things that you named. Um, but that, you know, maybe what I'm understanding is that maybe the, the, the big politicians are not what we should be looking at. We should be looking at the city councils and the local politicians that you're talking about so that there's an understanding. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, feel hurt on that part. Um, with us, with citizens who are aware of the negative impact of animal farming, talking to politicians, it's very important, I believe, because there are parts that politicians and people, they do not know. A part that's so important, for an example, if people think that without animal agriculture, we will not have enough food to eat, many people and politicians fail to realize that 70% majority of the grains that's produced in the US goes towards feeding animals. We could use that 70% of grains to feed more than 800 millions of people who are starving around the world. And we are feeding 9 billion animals just in the US. So definitely by going towards plant-based diet, we will feed more people than we are feeding right now, being more on the meat-based diet. And that's, that's what we need to communicate well or educate well the politicians, especially. Yeah, um, I'm, hearing, <clears throat> I'm hearing that, um, that amidst the political um, you know, communications that go on, that, that what's, what's really not understood is the fact that, that we are actually um, just right here in the U.S., we're growing plenty of food to, to feed 800 million starving people and that, and that you, I'm sensing that you feel it's a, uh, an understanding issue and a knowledge issue via information that that people don't understand this and and you know and and that there's that this is a big reason why things aren't changing absolutely, absolutely. i i definitely feel hurt on that part um and the one thing that um <clears throat> i believe um people um do not quite understand the importance is uh, the antibiotic resistance. Um, I believe that we are actually facing um, a time where bacteria and superbugs who are resistant to antibiotics are actually evolving. And one of the biggest reason that they're actually evolving to resist this antibiotics is because of the tremendous use of these drugs in animal farming. And because of that, we are actually using the last mile of antibiotic drugs. And if this trend will continue, 
cancer and AIDS will not be a huge problem for us, but the biggest epidemic will be just a simple cold that we cannot treat by antibiotics and people will die from that. And that's the huge concern that in healthcare, in pharmaceuticals, in politics, and local citizens don't quite are aware of. That's me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, hear you I hear you addressing that, uh, that very present for you is the, the urgency about the antibiotic resistance, um, which comes from, from overuse in the animal agriculture industry. Um, and your concern is that is that while we're we're running out of out of runway with our antibiotics, at the same time the the little bacteria are evolving and are going to get more and more powerful. And so we're we're like you know in my parlance we'll be shooting ourselves in the foot. And and you're you know and we're we're you know you're very concerned that this lack of understanding about this issue is maybe the scariest thing about the whole thing for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely completely feel heard. And I just want to say that um, as an animal rights... That was our five minutes, though. Just so okay. And so, we have, we have, we're going to be closing the room, too, right? We're at quarter yes. till. Yeah, it's, we, we're going to dawn the empathy circle uh, because we all at the uh, 15 minutes before the two hours. Already, I know it, it goes so fast, right? So, so fast. Thank you so much, Guy. And we're going to go to the big, big circle now with everybody. And then we'd like to hear from you, like, what was the most helpful things you, or most thing that you've learned cool. today in the empathy circle? Okay, I'm going to bring that together, hitting the close button. I think it gives us... Uh, 60 seconds. Yeah, break it when we close. Everybody sees the 60 seconds. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. Nilan?